The work is done, grown old, he thought, according to my boyish plan. Let the fools rage, I swerved in naught, something to perfection brought. begin with a poem of mine called the Lake Isle of Innisfree, because if you know anything about me, you will expect me to begin with it. It is the only poem of mine which is very widely known. I will arise and go now, and go to Innisfree, and a small cabin build there of clay and wattles made. Nine bean rows will I have there, a hive for the honey bee, and live alone in the bee cloud glade. Well, I think Gates has done what, uh, what he hoped might happen. He hoped that that uh, his words would become current. I mean, he actually wanted his songs to be sung as Dante overheard his songs being sung. But there is a Shakespearean contribution in a way. A lot of his lingo has become common lingo. A lot of his lines have become lingo, if you like. Things fall apart. A terrible beauty is born. I will arise and go now. Romantic Ireland's dead and gone. Cast a cold eye on life on death. So on. Uh, just at that very simple level, he has changed the language that we speak. It suggests a sort of family group. There's my father and mother and my sister and I all together, like any normal family. Um, but um, I think one has to think of it more as a threesome. Because my father, um, partly because he was much older than most fathers, he was 56 when I was born, uh, and also because he was in ill health. And anyway, I think it wasn't uh, his thing, as it were, to go romping with the children. He didn't really um, act uh, as a father might normally do. When I look at this photograph that was taken in Barry Lee, uh, in, in Gort, of W.B. Yeats with my brother and myself, um, I look at the book and I think, now, I think to myself, well, now, quite obvious that father was told that uh, he was going to be photographed with the children, and he put the book down, waiting to pick it up at the earliest possible opportunity. I mean, the way that it's put down with the pages open suggests that. So he, uh, it always amuses me that. Uh, I'm used to having a father who is a world famous poet. I never had any other. And I've even on occasion asked people, well, what is it like to have a normal father? I've never had the experience. Almost always, wherever you go, they say, oh, yes, would you be related, etc." So that it's, um, it's a kind of shadow from which one can never really escape. And I often think, in fact, uh, particularly in Ireland, that I'm in some ways a sort of small part of a national monument. W. B. Yeats looked the poet, and he lived the poet. Since his death on the 28th of January, 1939, he has come to be ranked the dominant poet of our century. It is not easy to assign him a lower place. Born in Dublin at Georgeville on June the 13th, 1865, William Butler Yeats was the eldest child of John Butler Yeats and Susan Mary Pollexfen. His mother, 
reared in Sligo in the west of Ireland, and his father, Dublin bred, were like two poles of his personality, one sceptical and metropolitan, the other nostalgic and regional. I think the Yeats genes emerged probably in my father's interest in, uh, in matters artistic and literary, his interest in becoming a poet, his uh, determination never to be anything else. He, was, he never held a position of any kind, but was always a full-time poet. Um, and uh, the Pollocksman genes, I think probably in his making a success of it, in his driving ambition, which not alone enabled him to make a success of a very uncertain career, but also to create with his, uh, his friends a complete literary revival, and of course the Abbey Theatre later on. The Pollux friends had their faiths from birth. They were Protestants and Unionists, while John Butler Yeats, in spite of his Anglo-Irish upbringing, was a nationalist. I think it seems quite clear that in the Yeats household, when my father was growing up, that John Butler Yeats is very much the dominant figure. Mrs. Yeats, Susan Mary Pollocksman, when she married my grandfather, she married, she thought, a barrister who everyone thought was going to be extremely successful. She had been used to many servants. And all of a sudden, uh, she found that no sooner was he married and had a child, my father, than he decided to give all that up and become a painter. Not only that, but away from Ireland in London, which she hated. She'd never left Sligo in a spiritual sense at all. And so she was able to convey her feelings about Sligo to them from the time they were very small. But probably from the very beginning rep represented a, a kind of Shangri-La to the, when they were small. Much of Yeats's early childhood was spent in the company of his mother, his brother Jack, and his two sisters, Lily and Lobby. Jack Yeats's painting Memory Harbour is a, is, a, is a perfect example of how this feeling for Sligo, this intense feeling for Sligo, emerges. And the fact that it was uh, William Butler Yeats's favourite brother's picture uh, all his life, bears that out. When I look at my brother's picture, Memory Harbour, houses and anchored ship and distant lighthouse all set close together as in some old map, I recognize in the blue-coated man with a mass of white shirt the pilot I went fishing with, and I am full of disquiet and excitement. They had hung around the, the docks looking at the ships coming and going. They uh, liked the local donkey races, going down to Ross's Point to see the sea there, all that sort of thing. And I think for both of them it represented um, a Sligo which perhaps had long since gone, but a Sligo of their childhood, perhaps uh, slightly rosy-eyed, as, as it were, um, the romantic Sligo that one would remember from one's youth. All his life, Yeats retained his fondness for the places he knew as a child. As a boy, he found what he wanted in reverie and solitude. He wandered by himself about the caves and dreamed the days away. Where dips the rocky highland of Sleuth Wood in the lake, there lies a leafy island where flapping herons wake the drowsy water rats. There we've hid our fairy vats, full of berries and of reddest stolen cherries. Come away, O oh human child, to the waters and the wild, with a fairy hand in hand. For the world's more full of weeping than you can understand. The Yeatses 
moved impecuniously between London, Dublin and Sligo. At the age of nine in 1874, Yeats returned with his family to London, where for two years, John Butler Yeats took over his son's education. In his 11th year, Yeats was sent to the Godolphin School Hammersmith for his first formal instruction. As a student, he did not distinguish himself. Poor in classics and good in science, he affected to despise the one and exalt the other. For the first time, he was with boys his own age, and they laughed at his awkwardness and bullied him because he was weak, because he was a poor student, and because he was not English. In defiance, he became more Irish and more unhappy and sought for out-of-the-way knowledge beyond the reach of the classrooms. 